coming up, a place pounded hard by centuries of change. Yet St. Paul Islanders still call themselves people of the seals. Yes, I, I love my island. I'm not on the archery. It lets me be who I am. And although only a handful here are fluent in the language of the land, something remarkable has happened. I think it's the responsibility part of it. The responsibility to work with elders to save the language. And then to teach it. We are teaching and learning at the same time. Ahead, more than just words, what it takes to bring a language back to life. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. Alaska has about 20 native languages, and the odds are against most of their survival beyond this century. Even so, native groups haven't given up, not on the Pribilof Islands, out in the middle of the Bering Sea, about 700 miles west of Anchorage. That is where you'll find St. Paul Island, home to about 450 people who believe they took action just in time to pull their language back from the brink. Long before the first humans arrived, St. Paul Island was home to birds and seals. In fact, the fur seals are what brought the Russians here. The first wave of oppression. In the late 1700s, they captured natives from nearby islands and brought them here as slaves to slaughter and skin the seals. The next wave of exploitation, 1867, when the United States bought Alaska from the Russians. The forced labor continued, eventually under strict federal control. Even today, so many strands of history intermingle, like the hymns sung in this church. Some in English, some in Russian, and even Aleut, the name the Russians gave to the islanders and their language. in recent years have people on the island begun to use their own name for themselves, Unangan, and for their language, Unangam Tunu. I'm asking you, what do you want to learn about St. Paul? So much, so much. Greg Freda says it all starts with the land. Yes, Mayungwa. This is mine. We love the sea and the land because it provides. I love my island. It lets me be who I am. The land and the language. It's our identity, Rhonda. It's our identity. It's who we are as a people. An identity Greg has fought all his life to keep from the time he was in school and forbidden to speak his language. As a kid, you were threatened with punishment. Yes. How did you find the courage to stand up to that? Anang, anang, anang. Angunako. What I am is very big. Nobody will change me. And now, Greg is just one of a handful of fluent speakers left on the island, a place under siege on so many fronts. The birds that come to the island to nest and raise their young have declined. From here, all the way over to that end where covered with MERS and all those birds. Now look what you see. They're gone. They're dead. And it's not just the birds, but also the seals. 
It may seem like the beaches are crowded, but the pups are at their lowest numbers in a hundred years. There were thousands. Imagine that, thousands. They're gone. I mean, they're just few. The rookeries are off limits when the pups are small. A disturbance could trigger a stampede that could trample them to death. Yet despite efforts to protect them, their numbers continue to drop. Males, females, and pups, I'd say 15 to 20,000 animals. They're gone. There's one rookery completely empty. Greg says the cows normally leave their pups and swim way out into the ocean to feed and replenish their supply of milk. They can be gone for days, but now stay out longer and longer, apparently because they can't find enough to eat, so their pups go hungry and fewer survive. For the islanders who depend on the seals for their food, the fear grows. If the seals disappear, so will they, along with their language. The Unangan and the seals, their histories go hand in hand, shaped by forces beyond their control. We were slaves of the harvest. We were slaves. Greg is old enough to remember federal management of the commercial seal harvest. I started as a skin boy who would throw skins when they count them. He made 42 cents an hour. But it wasn't just the pay. It was how the government controlled almost every aspect of his family's life. These cottages were built by the government. Reminders of a time when it decided who you could marry and where you could live. A time when federal managers could appear at your doorstep at any moment to inspect your home for cleanliness they even screen the mail. It was miserable, it was fear, fear putting them. Don't do this, don't do that. And don't speak your language. The, of the, the, the church was the one place where the government left the Unangan alone, where they were free to speak their language, a place to keep hope alive that they would one day take back their island and their culture. At last, they've begun to do that. This shows the labor that it took to get the seals uh, for their furs. Greg joins a group of tourists to watch the community dance group perform. They keep time with Lepotkin, the shoulder blades from seals. The tourists have all heard about the Alaskan gold rush, but not the fur rush that came before it. And although the struggles of the Yanangan and their language are far from over, there is still much to celebrate. They are no longer slaves of the harvest, but now masters of their future. <laughs> One other historical note, check out this portrait of William Henry Seward, who put together the deal to buy Alaska for $7.2 million. Somehow, it's fitting it hangs in the heart of the governor's mansion in Juneau, even though at the time, critics branded it as Seward's folly. But what the history books don't always tell you is why Seward thought it was such a good deal, how the federal government wanted to cash in on the commercial seal harvest. In the first 20 years after the sale, more than two million seals were harvested. From 1870 to 1889, the net revenue to the government was over $6 million. And over the next two decades, the government earned almost three and a half million. So the bottom line, the government came out way ahead of what it spent to buy Alaska. And the people of St. Paul Island were paid just a fraction of those profits, mostly with credit at the government store. Up next, you can't put a price tag on the loss of language and culture. When we come back, the hard work of bringing back what was lost. In order to keep the language alive, we have to speak it. Linguists say all you have to do to measure the health of a language is count the number of children who speak it. In a lot of Alaska Native communities, only the elders are fluent enough to carry on actual conversations. 
Their adult children perhaps understand, but usually answer back in English. And their kids, well, they neither understand nor speak, a sign the language is about to die. But on St. Paul Island, some say there's been a miraculous rebirth of Unangam Tanu. But those on the front lines of language preservation say it's no miracle, just lots of hard work and determination. One of the highlights for tourists, the dance group led by Aquilina Lestenkoff, a longtime culture warrior. One of her first battles to bring back the traditional dances that had long disappeared from the island, but the songs were still around. If I were to translate it, Kila Mechamna means the morning is good. Aquilina says she saw the movements to these songs in a dream. The island had more elders to help the younger generation save their language. We say they're done visiting this land, that when they pass, it hurts even more because we're doing this. We don't have everything, definitely, and we do feel that reality looming in front of us. And it's more than a matter of words. Is waterfall. It's the ability to use them in conversation that's most important because without a voice, a language dies. It's hard, gratifying work, um, but well worth the effort. And the hard work begins here at the Community Language and Cultural Center. Very good, very good. When they were about 14, Teresa Baker and Lene Kozlov were recruited for a summer language camp. Even though they knew very little Unangam Tanu, the tribal government paid them to learn their language and how to teach it. Is it okay if we record you? Yes. Today, they're still on the payroll, and a big part of their job to sit down with elders on a regular basis. Today is August 21st. I'm here with Gregory Freitas Sr., Zinaida Malavidov. Greg Freitas and his niece, Zenita, Z for short, take part in what's called a language hunt, conversations that will be turned into <laughs> lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Z is part of that generation that understands but doesn't speak. So these language hunts give her a chance to brush up on Unangam Tanu or Aliu. Sometimes I miss the friends that are gone. I wish I could talk to them in Aliu, but there's nobody, only him. <laughs> The two carry on like comedians. I always say it's best to woo a girl in Aleut. <laughs> <laughs> Laughter is one of the byproducts of the language hunt. Then I say, Tiwumchuda. Kiss me. <laughs> Soon they get down to business and finish work on a Where Are You From exercise. Tanach Amich Ilan Akhtakan. Teresa and Lene try out their latest version. They want to say, I'm from the land of the fur seal. But Greg objects to their use of the word lakuda. Are you from the land of the seal pup? I think that's what you're trying to say, right? Lakuda, Greg says, refers to seal pups. And it doesn't make any sense to say you're from the land of the pups. So they go back to the drawing board. In order to keep the language alive, we have to speak it. And we have to mumble, and we have to fumble, and we have to pick ourselves back up and keep trying to speak it. But that is all part of the plan. If you fail to plan, you better plan to fail. And the plan is laid out for everyone to see. Anyone in the community can volunteer to take on one of these tasks. Nobody's like left carrying a, a big load. We all share in it. 
what you're looking at is an elaborate system designed to replicate what children do naturally when they grow up in a home with fluent speakers. It is complex. We are teaching and learning at the same time. But it's also a way to break down the tasks of rebuilding language into simple parts. In your language hunt, you may be going for a bite-sized piece of language. Each language hunt is transcribed and tracked on what's called the fluency freeway, with numerous milestones along the way. At each stop, the lessons are road tested, often reviewed by elders, and then perfected until they're ready for the classroom. Up next, the rebirth of a language. How St. Paul Island is doing what some thought was impossible to achieve. St. Paul Island uses a language program called Where Are Your Keys? The brainchild of Evan Gardner, an Oregon man on a mission to save endangered languages. Several other Alaska Native communities have embraced his teachings and bring something of their own into the mix. Because when it comes down to it, saving a language takes a lot of love, faith, and commitment. And perhaps the greatest of these is love. Checking local forecast for the Pribilof Islands. Today, clouds and rain showers, highs in the lower 50s, south winds today 10 to 20 miles per hour. People on St. Paul Island show their love in many ways. Have a good day. Mac Mandragan. Have a good one. Study hard. The school maintenance man is out here every morning. I try to encourage him to be positive. And there's lots to be positive about. <laughs> These kids are ready to run with a language once on its last legs. <laughs> Conversation, one of the building blocks of the Where Are Your Keys program. The What Is This lesson is one of many that encourages children to speak rather than just listen. But there's something else. Where Are Your Keys also incorporates American Sign Language. Um. So the children learn two languages at once. You're using more senses. The more senses you use, the more you're going to learn. Michael Baldwin oh, ought to know. Ah, ba, ka, da. Signing was his first language. His mother, June, who was deaf, grew up on the island, raised in a family where everyone had to sign including her sister, Aqualina, who was excited to discover how signing had yet another purpose. If you look at babies, um, their, their physical actions say something about them. Aqualina says sign language comes naturally to children and found it easy to adapt to Unangam Tanu. Unangam are known for their beautiful visors, so we've taken it and we've gone like this, Unangam. Too new. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, and it takes two to talk, right? <laughs> Aquilina says teenagers were quick to learn how to sign and pass on this skill. Do we underestimate teens? Yes, I do believe that we are in a place where we waste the time of teenagers. If you give them the tools to teach something, they're going to be more beneficial adults. Kilangan, anything coming up? The early investment in these young women continues to pay dividends. Check that list. They are committed keepers of the culture. Because it's not just a foreign language to me, it's my language, it's my self-identity, this is how I know myself, this is what my ancestors did, this is what I'm doing. Uh, talking. Allah, Cancun, Ukada!
Anna Porath was 19 when the tribal government recruited her to teach Unangam to new. Atakin, Ala, Kunkun, Ukuda, Oh! Vlad and I are out. Nobody looked at me. Anna is now 25 and has just earned her degree in elementary education. Oh, say, Sayu Koki! Anna hopes to become fluent in Unangam Tanu. One more time, you ready? Takin, Ala, Kankun, Ukuda. So, what's your dream for your students? To love learning, to never stop. Make a line. Love is the language's best hope. Atakin ala kankun unangadin. And what you see here is hope for more speakers of Unangam Tanu. Si chin chong atung unangadin ulung kam ching. Si ching unangadin hat de unangadin. And again, it's more than just about words. Also about the land and the culture. And the seals are at the heart of that. They share a history with the people and hopefully a future, a relationship that's hard to understand unless you live here. It's boiling, my potatoes. Or are lucky enough to have dinner with Z. Zanita Melavidov, one of the best cooks on the island. This is my seal. The meat comes from a recent harvest. Here's my rice. See, I'm used to cooking for lots. Zanita likes to bring the best of both worlds to her meals. I'm going to make the gravy. Zanita usually butchers the seal herself. These big chunks, the part of the shoulder meat, this part is part of the, the knuckle. The flipper part. Definitely Unangan soul food. Okay. The love of good food, oh, yeah. good company, and words of gratitude, the glue that holds it all together. Jesus Christus, when kakach to me nagnan karalako, a kak kimili to me blogoslavila kinayakoki. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the food we are about to receive. Send down your Holy Spirit and bless it for us. We thank you. Sprasnikum. A Russian word thrown in for good measure. Sprasnikum, or happy feast. Before we go, we want to make mention of two elders, both fluent speakers of Unangam Tanu or Alyu. I'm full of value. I, I know a whole bunch of value. Maritina Krukoff died earlier this year. She was 92. When we met her last August, she told us about another chapter in the island's history that we didn't get to cover in this program, how everyone on St. Paul Island was forcibly evacuated during World War II. We also want to recognize another elder that St. Paul Island lost in the last year, Edna Floyd, who taught Unangan studies at the school for decades. She was 75. As they say on the island, their time visiting the land is done, but their memories will live on. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.